psalmist. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Well, we sing the words of that psalm together as we turn to hymn number 103b, uh, 103b. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet your tribute bring. Hymn number 103b. as we sit, let's draw our hearts together and come to our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to call upon you this evening, to call you our Father, to know with absolute certainty that you listen, that you answer prayer, 
And we come not able to point to any merit of our own. We come not pointing to any achievements. We come not boasting in ourselves, but we do come with great confidence because of the God that you are and because we come in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our great King, our great High Priest. We come to a gracious and loving Father and how gently and tenderly you treat your people. We've just sung, Father-like, he tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. What a wonderful thing it is to come before you, a God like that. We so often feel so feeble, so aware of our limits, fearful of our foes. But you promise to never leave nor forsake your people. You use even our best efforts and our foolish mistakes ultimately for your own purposes. You are a good God who is perfectly faithful, a keeper of all your promises. You are utterly trustworthy. And how such truths are a reassurance and comfort to us. We can't but praise and worship you for who you are, your gentleness, your patience, your goodness. And so as we gather together this evening, no matter the afternoon we've had, no matter the worries that crowd in upon us, no matter the tasks that we know we'll have to face tomorrow, we know amidst all of that, that your word is sufficient that it deals with life as it really is, with people as they really are. So would you teach us? Would you comfort us? Would you encourage us? Would you change us by your word this evening so that we might stand firm, that we might adorn the gospel with our lives and testify to the truth with our lips, that we might bring honor to you, our Father in heaven, so draw near to us this evening as your people. Speak to us tenderly, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good call. Cool. Can I warmly welcome you to uh, the Tron Church this evening? You perhaps should have uh, had one of these this morning. If you didn't, there should have been some on your way in. I just want to draw your attention to a few things uh, going on in the life of the church this week. Uh, you'll see there that we have uh, our congregational prayer meeting, which is this Wednesday evening at 7.30. And we meet together to pray for the work here, but also further afield as we look uh, across the world. And in particular, this Wednesday evening, we're going to be showing a short uh, video giving a bit of an introduction to a new course which has been developed by the folk who made Christianity Explored. It's a new course called Life Explored, which will be running as a church uh, early in the new year. So we'll be finding out a bit more about that and we can be praying for that and thinking about folk uh, to invite. So do come along on Wednesday. We'll be hearing about that and we'll, we'll be praying together. So do come if you possibly can. And you'll see that we meet again next week uh, as usual on Sunday at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning at Kelvin Grove uh, here at 11 o'clock and then the afternoon uh, across at Queen's Park at 4.30 and then again here at 6.30 uh, next Sunday evening. So do be praying for those, and do come and gather together as we sing God's praises. That's all the notices, but do take a look at that and use that uh, for the coming week. Well, we sing again, and we turn in our hymn books to hymn number 724. All my days I will sing this song of gladness, give my praise to the fountain of delights, for in my helplessness you heard my cry, and waves of mercy poured down on my life. Hymn number 724.
Well, we turn now to God's Word, and we are continuing our series in the book of Joshua. So do turn with me to Joshua chapter 9, which you'll find on page 184, if you have one of the church uh, visitor Bibles. Joshua chapter 9. And we'll read the, the whole chapter. We've just, uh, this is coming off the back of uh, two battles, the Battle of Jericho and uh, the Battle of Ai. Well, it was two parts. The first was the defeat, and then the Battle of Ai part two, which we looked at last week, where Joshua and his army were victorious. And this uh, charts the next uh, chapter in the conquest. So Joshua chapter 9. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland across all along the coast of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn out patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes. And all their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. So now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us then. How can we make a covenant with you? They said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you? And where do you come from? They said to him, From a very distant country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country said to us, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Come now, make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm when we took it from our houses as food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they've burst. And these garments and sandals of ours are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore to them. At the end of three days after they had made a covenant with them, they heard that they were neighbors and that they lived among them. And the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chethriah, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. But all the leaders said to the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to them. Let them live. Lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. Joshua summoned them and said to them, Why did you deceive us, saying, We are from very far from you when you dwell among us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood 
and drawers of water for the house of my God? They answered Joshua, Because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now behold, we are in your hands. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, do it. So he did this to them and delivered them out of the hand of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place that he should choose. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We turn now to sing again. Hymn number 761. And uh, the great error of the people of Israel then was a failure to consult the Lord. And this hymn reminds us that we are to leave God to order all our ways. Whatever comes in Him confide. So let's sing together hymn number 761. the musicians will play for us now and uh, as they do that the offering for the Lord's work will be uplifted and uh, perhaps as that's going on you might want to read over that chapter again from Joshua. It's a good little story isn't it? It's an intriguing story but perhaps you might want to spend a minute or two looking over that again as the offering is uplifted.
Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for your great generosity to your people. We thank you for your great generosity to us. We thank you for all that you have showered upon us in the Lord Jesus. And we do pray for these small gifts that we've been able to give. We thank you for the earthly possessions you have given to us, and we pray that for what we've just given and for what we give to the work, uh, both here and worldwide, we do pray that that might be used wisely, that it might be used for the furtherance of the work of the gospel. And we do pray for that work and for the parts that each of us play in that work as we as a, as a church seek to carry out the great mission that you have given us, that great task of proclaiming to the nations uh, the wonderful gospel and that great task of making disciples. So we do pray that you might enable and equip us for that task and help us not just to give of our money but also of our time and our talents that we might use them well and wisely and sacrificially for the work that you've called us all to. We pray particularly for those who we partner with. We pray particularly for uh, Hope for Glasgow. Uh, we do pray for uh, Terry. We thank you for his ministry to us this morning. And we do pray as they make plans, as they prepare, as they get things ready, that you might greatly encourage him and others as they line things up for Hope for Glasgow and all the different aspects that they seek to work and to reach out. And we do pray particularly that you might enable and equip him as he develops partnerships with local churches. And we do thank you for encouragements of late with uh, churches seeking to partner and to uh, seek to draw alongside him in that work. And we do pray there might be rich fruit flowing from that uh, gospel ministry, not just in the coming months, but in the coming years, that we might see rich fruit flowing from that work. So please encourage Terry and encourage all those who are involved with Hope for Glasgow in these early days. We pray too for the upcoming uh, Advent season as we approach Christmas and for all the opportunities there are to invite friends and family and colleagues and neighbours along to various things. We pray for the carol services. We pray for the uh, candidate carols at Kelvin Grove on the 11th. We pray for services on the 18th of December as well. We do pray that many visitors may come along and may they be struck not just by your word being taught but also by the truth being lived out as we as a church demonstrate the truth of the gospel and how we live how we interact how we welcome and may that prove to be a powerful witness to the Lord Jesus and so we pray particularly this Christmas that you may give us as a fellowship great joy in seeing new life of people being drawn to the truth 
being drawn from darkness to light as we celebrate the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So enable and equip us, Lord. Encourage us in this work. For it is not our work, but yours, and you invite us to take part in it. What a great privilege. And so we ask, as we come to your word this evening, might you equip and enable us in that task. Encourage us if we're downhearted. Comfort us if we're fearful. And strengthen us if we're in need of that. Please help and equip us now by your word, for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word, we turn to sing hymn number 546. God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging words, each from age to age proclaiming God the one, the righteous Lord. Hymn number 546. Well, please do turn to Joshua chapter 9, and we'll be spending a few moments uh, looking at that together. So Joshua chapter 9. Now we are entering, as we come to chapter 9, a new stage in the conquest. We've just witnessed the conquering of two cities, Jericho and Ai. And now in chapter 9, verse 1, we see a grand coalition of forces coming together to take on Joshua and his army. Kings drawn from across the promised land come together. Perhaps having heard about the rather embarrassing battle of Ai, part 1, they feel that Israel is maybe a bit more vulnerable than they first thought. Perhaps they feel they've got a chance if they take them on in battle to defeat them. And so they gather as one to fight against Joshua and against all of Israel. But before we get to learn about the outcome of this great alliance, the focus shifts to another city, another group of cities, Gibeon. 
they take a slightly different approach to Joshua and his army. Rather than fight, they opt to deceive and to infiltrate. And it works. It seems that the rather dizzy heights of the defeat of Ai and the covenant renewal at Mount Ebal that we read about last week, things have come crashing down to reality here in chapter 9. God's people make mistakes. And they have to live with the consequences. They rashly and unthinkingly enter into a covenant with one of the peoples that they were meant to devote to the destruction. But God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he uses even this event for his own purposes and for his own glory. Chapter 9, from the Israelite point of view, is a bit of a mess. It's a mess created, it's a mess lived with, but it is a mess redeemed. So we'll look at three points this evening. Firstly, a mess created, the foolish failure to seek God's will, verses 1 to 15. The plan that is hatched by Gibeon is high risk, but well conceived. They've heard enough about Israel and what they've been doing to develop a plan that they know might just work. They've heard enough to know that they are a people to fear. Just look at verse 3. They've heard what Joshua has done to Jericho and to Ai, and they figured that they would soon be in the firing line. But they've also heard, it would seem, that only certain peoples were marked out for destruction. Deuteronomy chapter 20 is absolutely key Uh, to understanding what's going on here. In that chapter, Moses sets out the nations who lived in the promised land who were to be totally destroyed by Joshua and by all of Israel. And it's the exact same list that we have there in verse 1. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. They were all to be destroyed by Israel because they lived in the promised land. But Deuteronomy 20 also sets out what Israel is to do with all the cities that are very far from you, which are not cities of the promised land. And Deuteronomy 20 tells them to offer peace. And if that offer is accepted, then the peoples are to be allowed to live and to work and do forced labor for Israel. That is the card that Gibeon decide to play. Look at verse 6. We have come from a distant country. So now, make a covenant with us. Their basic message is this. We are not one of the nations on your list. You can make peace with us. And to make the case, they've gone to all the effort of making it look like they've come from a long distance. They make things look very convincing. They don worn-out clothes and shoes and wineskins. They've brought their dry and crumbly provisions. And they do all this to make it look like they are indeed from a distant country. And they've been on the road for quite some time. Now, before we jump in and criticize Joshua and Israel for falling for it, we, the readers, have been let in on the secret. We know what's going on. Verse 4 tells us what they're up to. We know that Gibeon is not one of the distant nations. We know that they're acting cunningly, and they're trying to trick them. But Joshua and Israel don't find this out until it's too late. They don't find out until verse 16 what the truth is. But their suspicions are raised. Look again at verse 7. They've seen these guys arriving. They've seen their basic arguments. We're from a distant nation. And verse 7, the men of Israel say to the Hivites, perhaps you live among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you? They perhaps suspect something's not quite right. And the reply coming from the Hivites is rather evasive. They say, we are your servants. But again, doubts remain. And Joshua asks more directly, who are you? Where do you come from? This time, a more lengthy and pious-sounding reply comes. And much of what they say is undoubtedly true. But 
look at what they say. Down in uh, verse 8, verse 9, have a slightly longer reply. And much of what they say here is undoubtedly true. They have heard reports about what Joshua and Israel have done. They mention the battles they fought against Sihon and Og. But they wisely omit the recent battles against Jericho and Ai. They don't mention those. If they really were from a distant country, then they wouldn't yet have heard about those battles. They were just in the weeks before they arrive. There was no Twitter, no 24-hour news coverage to get the news to them. So the fact they don't mention those battles is part of the ruse, is part of their deceit. The men from Gibeon produce evidence to substantiate their claims. Look at us. We're worn out. We've traveled so far. Just look at our clothes, our wineskins, our sandals. Their basic plea is, we're from a distant nation. We've heard about your God, and we want to make peace with you. Let's make a covenant. What will Joshua and the leaders of Israel do? Well, look at verse 14. They take their provisions, presumably to examine them so as to determine the truth of their story. But crucially, notice the second half of verse 14. They do not seek counsel from the Lord. They go ahead and enter into this covenant with Gibeon. Now, this is an absolute mess. We, the readers, know the full story. We know that the people of Gibeon were on the list of people to be destroyed. That was the instructions given in Deuteronomy. That was what Joshua knew he was meant to do. But these people were on the list. And if only Joshua had sought counsel from the Lord... The evidence presented to him is quite convincing. Even under direct questioning and examining, the leaders of Israel were satisfied that these were indeed a people from very far away. It all looked right. What they were saying matched the reality they could see in front of them. They looked like they had come from a long way. But great wisdom was needed to discern the reality. One writer put it this way, how difficult to tell the difference between real faith, like Rahab's, and flattery, like Gibeon's. On the surface, both look pretty convincing. But they should have consulted the Lord. And there was provision available to Joshua. There was a way in which he could seek counsel. Listen to these words from Numbers. These are words said to Joshua. The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest in him some of your authority that all the congregation of the people may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest who shall inquire for him by the judgment of Urim before the Lord. So we see there back in Numbers that the Lord gave Moses an instruction that Joshua was to seek the Lord's counsel from the priest. There was a way made. There was a, a way in which Joshua was to go and seek counsel from the Lord. But he didn't make use of it. The writer's careful to record that there in verse 14. And the implication is this, that if he did seek counsel, if he did go to the Lord, then that foolish covenant with Gibeon would never have been entered into if only he had sought counsel from the Lord. It wasn't that Joshua didn't exercise discernment. It wasn't that he didn't ask good questions or use common sense. He did all the right things from that point of view. If we'd gone through the same process that Joshua did, I'm sure we would have arrived at the same conclusion. The problem was this. It's not that they were sloppy in their investigation but they, that they were alone in their decision. It wasn't that they didn't think, it was that they didn't pray. Common sense, thinking rightly, can only get us so far. If that's all we do, 
then really it's a failure to recognize and remember our own creatureliness. A failure to recognize that we have a creator, a father in heaven. On the face of it, Joshua seemed to make the right decision. He seemed, just looking at the evidence that was presented, he made the right choice. He knew what he was to do with the nations that were far off. It was told to him in Deuteronomy. He was trying to be faithful to that. He even pressed them to get to the truth. He questioned them. But there is a danger if we ever find ourselves relying solely on our common sense. If we think a decision is perhaps routine or so obvious that we don't need to resort to prayer. The enemy often resorts to tactics like this. Tactics that are subtle, that are deceptive, such as you have here with Gibeon. And it's been his tactic with God's people all through history. We need to exercise care and to avoid cocky independence. Think if we can do it on our own. We never grow out of complete dependence on him for all things. And how much more provision has God given to us now? All who call on the name of the Father have immediate access to the throne room in heaven because we come in Jesus' name. What an astonishing privilege we have. We just call on our Father. We can come to him anytime. Just listen to James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. As a church, as we make decisions, as we plan, as we reach out, prayer must be our starting point, our foundation. Even when the way forward seems obvious, even when common sense would dictate this is the right thing to do, we're to pray. No matter what situation we're facing, we're to pray. As individuals too, prayer is to be our starting point, so our standard operating mode. It's the means that God gives us to speak to him, to seek him, to submit to his will. A real mess is made through Israel's foolish failure to seek God's will. But it is a mess that they must live with. It's our second point. Looking on to verses 16 to 26. A mess lived with. And we see here the faithful fidelity to oaths made. The faithful fidelity to oaths made. Three days pass. Look at verse 16. And with that comes the shocking truth. It really is one of those what have we done sort of moments. How can we be so naive, so stupid? And they gear up for war, knowing the reality, knowing that this group of people who've deceived them, knowing that they were on the list of nations to be destroyed, And so, verse 17, they march on the city of Gibeon. But they don't attack them. Look at verse 18. They don't attack because of the oath sworn just a few days earlier. Now, a big question arises with that. You can imagine the discussion that would have happened around the campfires as the army was camping outside these cities. Surely, they would say, the covenant is null and void. We were duped, after all. You can imagine the lawyers amongst them arguing over the minutiae of contract law. Their offer was based on lies. It's misrepresentation. Can't we just tear up the covenant and treat them like the Hivites that they are and do to them just as we did to Jericho and Ai? You can imagine that sort of discussion going on. The people, verse 18, murmured against their leaders. But again, the leaders affirm the covenant that was entered into. Look at verse 19. But the leader said to all the congregation of Israel, we have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. We swore an oath. We must let them live, and they'll become our slaves and servants. This oath, this covenant that they entered into, was a complete mess. But it was a mess that they would have to live with. They were to remain faithful to the oath they had made, even in hindsight, even if it was a bad one. They would have to stick with it. 
An episode a little later in the history of Israel shows that Joshua was right to stick to this oath. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, you have recorded there a famine of three years. And the reason given for that famine was that Saul put to death some of the Gibeonites. Saul broke the oath that Joshua made, and the result was famine in the land. This was an oath that was to be kept. This was an oath that the leaders of the congregation had sworn in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And as a covenant made in the name of the Lord, it was his honor that was at stake. His very name was at stake and tied up with this covenant that had been made. To go back on that oath, to break that covenant, would have been to dishonor the Lord. And the lesson is surely this. An oath solemnly made in the name of the Lord must be fulfilled. We can't go back on them, even in hindsight, if they were entered into foolishly. And this was a foolishly entered into covenant. Yes, it was an absolute mess. But they were to live as faithfully as they could in that messy situation. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that greatly refreshing and encouraging. Life is a mess. Even life in the church is often a mess. And we'll be foolish to pretend otherwise. Perhaps we would like to pretend otherwise and pretend that life was neat and tidy. But that's not reality. People do make foolish vows. Perhaps you've made a vow like that yourself. You've made a foolish vow, even a serious one. Perhaps you've entered into marriage a bit hastily, and life is difficult and hard. Well, be faithful to your vow, even if it's messy. Perhaps you've made a vow of church membership, perhaps here or perhaps somewhere else. Are you demonstrating faithful fidelity to that oath, to that vow, even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, even if it would be easier not to? Our culture encourages us to hold very lightly to oaths made. It tells us that the main consideration must be our own happiness, our own satisfaction. If keeping a particular oath doesn't make you happy anymore, well, ditch it. Well, this passage says the opposite. You stick to your oaths, even if it's rashly made. Let's take the example of marriage again. Let me read you this from C.S. Lewis. He said that people get from books the idea that if you have married the right person, you may expect to go on being in love forever. As a result, when they find that they are not, they think this proves they have made a mistake and are entitled for a change, not realizing that when they have changed, the glamour will presently go out of the new love just as it went out of the old one. It's an example of people holding lightly to an oath. At the heart of marriage, it's not an emotion or a feeling, but a commitment to actively love now and in the future. You do the acts of love despite your feelings, despite what you might get out of it. You keep your oath. So yes, we might be in a bit of a pickle. We may have made a mess of things. We may have foolishly made a promise. Life may well be very difficult or hard because of our past mistakes or foolishness. And yes, we may well have repented of that. We may have confessed our sin. But even though we're forgiven, we still have to live with the consequences of our sin. We don't get to lay down our oaths, even if they are foolishly entered into. We must keep and remain faithful to God and to the people we've made those oaths to. This is the very same message that we find on the lips of Jesus in the New Testament. We recently looked at Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings, and uh, this will be familiar to you, but Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, Jesus is tackling this exact topic of keeping oaths. He says this, It was also said... Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone 
who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you've sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great kings. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So Jesus is saying there, in both the closest of relationships, both in marriage and in our most extensive relationships, Jesus expects people to be those who keep their word. And it's because God is faithful and a keeper of his promises, because he is utterly trustworthy that his people are to be likewise. His people are likewise to be trustworthy and true to their word. So you and I are to be men and women of our words. We are to be known as trustworthy people. What we say, we do. And sometimes keeping our word is just downright inconvenient. But rather than seeking a way out, we're to keep it. We're to keep our word. Even though the Gibeonites were duplicitous and they lied, God's people had to demonstrate fidelity to that oath, even with hindsight if it was rashly made and foolish. God's people keep their oaths, they keep their words. A mess to be lived with. This passage teaches us to remain faithful to oaths, even those rashly made. But finally, this passage also teaches us that even the worst of messes can be redeemed. So this is our third point, a mess redeemed, the family fellowship the Gibeonites witnessed. And this is looking at the end, verse 27. Notice what Joshua does. He addresses them back in verse 22. He says, why did you deceive us? Now, therefore, you are cursed, and some of you shall never be anything but servants, cutters of wood and drawers of the water for the house of my God. And then look down again at verse 27. But Joshua made them that day cutters of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord. So not only did the people of Gibeon get to keep their lives, but they were to serve the people of God. And specifically, they were to serve the altar. They were to be working in and about the house of the Lord. They were to be witnessing the family fellowship, the worship of God's people as they were in and around the tabernacle, witnessing the daily sacrifices. God, in his goodness and sovereignty and mercy, uses even the most foolish oath for his own good. Not only were the Gibeonites allowed to live, but they got to serve at the tabernacle. They would, in their daily work, they would watch the gospel lived out day by day. Not only in the lives of the people of God, but in the worship of the tabernacle. They would have seen and facilitated the slaughter of lambs and bulls and goats for the sins of the people. A visual demonstration of the gospel would have been enacted in front of their eyes, week by week, year by year. God is so good and gracious and so powerful that he overrules even the most foolishness, the most sinfulness, and from it accomplishes his own purposes. If you fast forward a few centuries, we find ourselves in familiar territory. We find ourselves in the book of Nehemiah. And who do we find there? Rebuilding the wall, but Gibeonites. Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 7. And next to them repaired Melathiah, the Gibeonite, and Jason the Moronathite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah. And then again in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 25, we read of the sons of Gibeon, 95 of them. God is a God who works out his purposes in the real world. 
a world of mess, a world in which men and women, just like us, make foolish choices. But he is a God who works in our mess and brings all things to work according to his plan and to his glory. So even as we look at the mess that we might have landed ourselves in, perhaps we have to live with an oath that was rashly made. But God can use such things, even those things, for his own glory. Perhaps we can't see how. But he is at work, and we can trust him. One preacher on this passage made this comment. Not that God's sovereignty or his goodness is ever an excuse for complacency or carelessness or prayerlessness or for believing that mistakes do not matter very much. But how the knowledge and the assurance that God can overrule in spite of everything, this is the wonder and glory of being in his service. This was a real mess. It was a mess of their own making. But it was a mess they had to live with. But it was a mess that ultimately God would redeem. God is sovereign. Whatever will befall me, Jesus will do all things well. He is sovereign and uses even big messes like this for his own glory and purposes. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you that your word speaks of reality. It speaks of real people in the real world who make real mistakes. We thank you for this passage from Joshua, which speaks of foolish decisions, of a failure to seek your counsel, but it also speaks of our obligation to keep our oaths to do just as we say. But it also speaks of your great sovereignty. You use even the biggest of messes for your own glory, your own purposes. Even centuries later, these Gibeonites were in amongst the people, rebuilding the city for your glory. Lord, you're a good and gracious God. And what assurance that brings to us that you can overrule in spite of everything. And it's all for your glory, all for your purposes. So would you help us to trust you? Because you are a faithful God. And you do exactly what you say. So help us to trust you in the midst of mess. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time together by singing a hymn that reminds us of God's sovereignty, his leading. Hymn number 869. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Let's sing hymn number 869.
please do stay on and continue our fellowship as we continue to speak and encourage one another. There'll be tea and coffee appearing just beside me here and down in uh, the half landing. So do stay on and encourage one another. Let me pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.